Good evening. Good to see everyone here. Shall we stand? Brother Chris, you want to open our service in prayer, please? Amen. Would you like to remain standing? We'll open with a song here. Sister Lane, will you? Page 342 in the Church of God hymnal. 342. Shield me from the foe in the hollow of his mighty hand. In the hollow of his mighty hand. In the hollow of his mighty hand. By the Holy Spirit's power, he will keep me every hour. In the May be seated. Page Thank you. 
Sing page 364. 364.
we have different ways of worshiping God. But one way we worship him is by getting a hymnal and singing from the depths of our hearts. And it does your soul good. If you happen to just be kind of looking around and your mind wandering, you probably miss that blessing tonight. But I think of, I've read many times how psychologists will tell us that singing does good for your entire body. But you add to that the truths that are in God's word that have been put to music. I'm telling you, it feeds your soul. As we sang the hollow of his mighty hand, I read in the scripture today how that we are the apple of God's eye. Isn't that beautiful? We are the apple of God's eye. We're very important to him. And he takes care of us. If we reach out to him and depend on him, he takes care of us. And when he takes care of us, he does an all right job. And I thank God for that tonight. And then we sang, uh, he lives. And in there it talks about he walks with me and he talks with me. Isn't that beautiful? What a privilege. Not everybody has that privilege in the world today that you and I have, that we can walk with him and we can talk with him. And he tells us that we're his child. Isn't that beautiful? And then this hymn I, I love so well, Alone with God. What a privilege it is to get along with God, the world forbidden. Alone with God, oh, blessed retreat. Alone with God and in him hidden to hold with him communion. If you've missed that communion with God today, you've missed something very special. And I would encourage you to grab it before the day is out because there's nothing like having that communion with God, meditating on his word, talking to him. What a privilege it is. And I just want to thank God tonight for his many blessings to me. I thank him for his faithfulness. I thank him for his sustaining grace, for the comfort he's providing. It's absolutely amazing what God can do when we lead hard upon him. He's there to support us. And I'm very, very grateful tonight. I'm glad to be here. I look forward to this service today, all day. I said, dear Lord, what is, well, I drove through Starbucks, of all things. And the Starbucks lady said, well, what do you have planned for the day? And I was glad I could tell her, I have church tonight. What a blessing. They don't understand it, but that's okay. I do. And so I'm very thankful for what God has done for me. I want to thank God for uh, the beautiful services last weekend and for all of your help. For those who helped Sunday night with the food, we appreciate all of the many, many ways in which you stepped in. It's a beautiful, the choir did a beautiful job with beautiful service Sunday night. Sunday morning was beautiful. So we thank God for that. Thank God for his many, many blessings. Let's remember our upcoming camp meeting. I know it's a few months off, but we'll have to make plans for that. I did hear from Brother Decker, and he's planning to be here, which we're very thankful for. And uh, the Sturluckies are planning to be here, and others, I'm sure. So let's remember the upcoming meeting in a special way. Remember the Hamilton Saints, uh, too, if we, you would. Let's continue to remember Sister Christy and the precious saints over there. Amen. Any other spoken requests you'd like to mention tonight? Make known. Yes, Brother Brian. Man, Brother Troy and Sister Linda, yes. Yes. Awesome. What an awesome opportunity. Beautiful. Yes. Remember that. Remember the Cranston's. I think they've been trying to get home and have had some challenges. So let's remember Brother Rick. I've got some nice texts from him, and his wife has reached out to J my wife, and, uh, and we got a nice beautiful card from her, I think, recently. 
remember the Cranston's in a special. Remember the Boyd's? Yeah, he talked to me on Sunday night, and they may have a conflict tonight, but uh, with their they have a special service or a special get together this Saturday. The details for that I have, I think, up here. I'm going to ask their favorite daughter-in-law to post it for us in the back. Okay, their daughter-in-law. They'll post it in the back uh, so you all can maybe get a picture with your phone. But let's try to support that if we can. I believe it's 2 to 5 on Saturday. Is that correct? I think they're going to have some, some food or some dessert and things. So it should be quite nice. Of course, to be support them would be nice anyway. So let's remember that in a special way. Anything else? Brother Fisher. Awesome. Awesome. Man. Awesome. Beautiful. Let's remember this young man. Brother Jerry. Man. Your two boys. Yes, remember the Williams boys in a special way. Amen. Yes. Awesome, beautiful. Yes, Brother Chad and Sister. Sister Rachel. Unspoken request. Amen. The Lord sees every need. He certainly cares and he's concerned about every one of us. If you're able to kneel, we will. If you're not able to, that's okay. I'm going to ask Brother Darrell if he'll lead us in prayer tonight. Brother Darrell. Our precious Heavenly Father, it is indeed with very thankful hearts that we come before you this evening, dear God. We appreciate the many blessings of life you've bestowed upon us. Way you watch over and care for us, great God, we're so very, very thankful, Lord. We appreciate Sister Millie's testimony, dear God. These are beautiful songs that we have in our songbook, God, and they can inspire us, Lord, in our lives. We really appreciate it, God. You always have something good for us, Lord, and we thank you very much for that. We're thankful, Lord, for this midweek service that we have, that we can come in out of uh, our daily lives, dear God, and we can gather together with the saints to worship you. In spirit and truth, dear Lord, and we really appreciate that very much. Just praise you and help us, great God, each one, to put our best into the service that we can get out of it, God, what you have for us, Lord, and we'll thank you for that, great God. Then, Lord, we, we know that you've already taken account of these many, many burdens and many requests, dear Lord, that have been brought forth tonight, dear God. You know each one, Lord. We know there's many that are not well in their body, and we pray that you'd be with them and help them, each one. My God, be with them in a very special way, Lord. 
other burdens, dear God, the saints have mentioned, dear God, the uh, special ones, dear Lord. You know each need, dear God. We're so thankful, Lord, that you take account of them. Sometimes we can't hear them, we can't remember them, but we're very, very thankful that you're a great God. You've taken account of each one. You will move according to your divine riches and glory in heaven. We appreciate that very much. Dear God, we ask that you would just uh, bless in this service tonight. We're so very thankful for each part of the service, God. We really appreciate the singing, dear God, and the songs that we hear, dear God. We appreciate understanding that we have and the knowledge of the truth that we have, great God. And it comes a lot from your word, dear God, but also, as Brother David had said in the past, and ministers have said, dear Lord, our songs are so good because they remind us, dear God, of the truth. It helps us to understand what the truth is, dear God, and we really appreciate that very much. Just ask that you be in this service, Lord. Remember each aspect, Lord. We really appreciate your children. Bless them, dear God, as they would sing and any other that may have a song tonight, Lord. We know, great God, the most important part of the service is the reading of your word. But bring, dear God, the thoughts, dear Lord, that you've laid on the speaker's heart tonight. Pray that you help them in a very special way. Go with us, God. Guide and direct us. May we ever be faithful and humble, dear God, before thee in our lives. And we'll thank you for all you do in Jesus' name.
service to practice the ordinances of feet wash in the Lord's Supper. We're commanded to do that. It's not an optional thing. The Bible instructs us to do that. So we want to uh, do that in, in obedience to God's eternal word in their beautiful services. So we trust you're able to join us. We hope you are Sunday night. We'll meet up here uh, to begin the service and then we'll 
uh, move on to, to the basement. <coughs> All right, men's portion. Sometimes my way seems rough and long, but the road to heaven is a road to home. My trials here will soon. Father, we look to you tonight. That's our desire is that you abide with us. And Father, we're thankful for the privilege to walk with you. We're thankful, Father, for all that it provides, the protection, Father, and just the living truth of this risen Savior abiding in our life is, Father, something that we should be very grateful for. Go with us in the furtherance of this service. Want to remember the many needs that have been mentioned tonight, the unspoken requests, our country, and this service. Help us to look into the page of your eternal word. Give to us that which we stand in need of. Bless this dear people. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Psalms, the 107th chapter. I want to begin reading verse 1. Psalms 107 and verse 1. 107 and verse number 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north, 
uh, at, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, exclamation point. This commences the fifth and final book in the Psalms. The book of Psalms are divided into five books, similar to the Pentateuch, or fashion imitating the, the Pentateuch. And here we find the psalmist pleading for the people to proclaim what God has done. Four times in this chapter, which is 43 verses long, we find him imploring and beseeching and proclaiming the people to exclaim what God has done. He says in verse 8, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works of the children of men, exclamation point. Verse 15, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for the wonderful works of uh, for his wonderful works to the children of men, exclamation point. 21, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men, exclamation point. Verse 31, let's read one more. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for the, his wonderful works to the children of men, exclamation point. Are we getting a point here tonight? Clearly, the inspired penman was seeking a response from the people. How easy it is to take God's mercy and the, mighty, uh, the many mighty miracles that he has performed in our life for granted. Ingratitude seems to be the natural response by sinful humanity. And to work against this natural tendency, we must make concerted effort to testify. My message title tonight is Testifying. I want to deal with the subject of testifying. Is that okay? That's how I felt inspired this week was to preach on the subject of testifying. And I've got a poem for you. An effective way to witness, to deliver the good news, is to tell our unique story and for sin make no excuse. We each have something special to say and share with others, encouragement to offer to our sisters and our brothers. How the Lord redeemed us by the price he paid for sin came to live within us when our old life we traded in. All this can be accomplished when we practice self-denying, reach the lost and all the lonely by our, own, by our personal testifying. To testify or to Give one's testimony carries the common connotation of to tell the story of how one became a Christian. How you became a Christian. It may refer to a specific event in a Christian's life in which God did something deemed particularly worth sharing or be more general in nature. The Hebrew word for testimony actually means to do it again. To do it again. Tell it again. The word testimony is used in a few different ways. One common usage is when a person is brought into a courtroom and placed under oath to tell, attest to, or give witness to his or her personal knowledge or experience with reference to the case that's being heard. You brought her to court as a Christian. Is there enough evidence to convict you? Right? Is there enough evidence in our lives? So they took knowledge of the early morning brethren that they had been with Jesus. Acts 4.13. Is there enough evidence to convict us? To link the word Christian to the word testimony is to narrow the focus of the testimony and who can give it. Only a Christian can give a Christian testimony. And a Christian is one who has received forgiveness for sin by trusting alone in God and the work of Jesus Christ for that forgiveness. A Christian testimony is given when Christians relate how they came to know the Lord through the movement of the Holy Spirit in their hearts and lives. In a testimony, 
We are sharing how we became Christians by God's miraculous intervention and work in our lives through specific events. I know Brother Chad has talked about Brother Ronnie being next to him and how he was always so kind and helpful and gave him food when he needed it. I'm just teasing. But Brother Chad talked about that divine intervention. He happened to be at the same body shop where Brother Chris was and Sister Doreen was, and, or maybe they came after him. I don't know who came first. But anyways, the point being, it was through divine intervention. And that's beautiful to recount that. I don't get tired of hearing about that, do you? In fact, I, I, my mind goes to dear Brother Boyd. He stands up a lot and talks about coming to the church before he first came here. And uh, I don't get tired of hearing about that. Amen. God's miraculous intervention and work in our lives through specific events. Often we can only see that in hindsight. But sharing that experience is vital. A Christian testimony should not end with the conversion experience, but should also include the ways in which the Lord has worked in our lives to sanctify us for his service. Has God done anything since you were saved? You have more in your testimony. As an example, a testimony could include how he brought you through a difficult time in your life, such as a loss or some sort of severe illness, and built up your faith in him through that experience. We should also be able to describe the continual process by which the Spirit who now indwells us leads, guides, molds, and shapes us into mature Christians. Again, the focus should be on the Lord and His faithfulness. A testimony should not be to lift yourself up, but should be focused on the Lord and His faithfulness. Tonight, I'd like for us to consider five reasons why we should all testify. Here in this psalm, we find five different types of people in sin and sorrow and how God saved them. Each of these five testimonies should resonate with us and provide us with another reason to testify. First of all, we find in those first several verses, or beginning verse number four, the strayer. The strayer, or the wanderer. Were any of us tonight wandering in sin? Did we stray far from God? We have reason to testify. Let's read it. Psalms 107, verse 4. They wandered, they strayed in the wilderness. In a solitary way, they found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way. I like that. He led them forth by the right way. There's only one way. It's Jesus Christ, John 14 and 6. He led them by the right way, singular, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Lost, hungry, thirsty, exhausted. These strayers or wanderers typify the Israelites in exile, but they also typify anyone who has not found the satisfaction that comes from knowing the Lord. That's a strayer. They're just merely spinning their wheels. Strayed far from God. Anyone who recognizes his or her own lostness, loneliness, can receive the offer of Jesus to satisfy these needs. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the bread from heaven. He's the living water. And he's the giver of rest. James, the half-brother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he spoke about rescuing these that have strayed, those that have strayed. In James 5 and 19, James 5 and 19, he says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, semicolon, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Or another rendering says, my brothers and sisters, if anyone among you strays from the truth and falls into error and another one turns him back to God, so let the latter one know that the one who has turned a sinner from the air of his way will save the one soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. That is, obtain the pardon of the many sins committed by the one who has been restored. 
Every one of us, in reality, strayed far from God. And that's something to testify about. Being lost in the wilderness without food and drink would be a frightful experience. God not only saved those who has, have strayed from him, but he leads them to the safety of the city. What is that city? What is that city? Go back to Psalms. These things excite me. What is that city? Psalms 107 verse 7 says, He led them forth by the right way that, he might go, that they might go to a city of habitation. What is this city of habitation? Go to the 132nd division of the Psalms. Psalms 132 and 13 says, For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it. What? Zion. For his habitation. We're getting closer to the truth here. What is the city of habitation? It's Zion. What's Zion? Go to Hebrews the 12th chapter. Where does God bring the strayer? Hebrews the 12th chapter, verse 22. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. That's merely the Greek rendering to the Hebrew word Zion, S-I-O-N. Uh, instead of Z-I-O-N. Unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. What are all these expressions of the general assembly and Church, God brings that strayer, he leads him to the city of habitation, which is the church. Now, can we get any more specific than that? We can, amen, because the church is not this building. Jesus said, or the Hebrew writer speaking about Christ, but in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, Hebrews 10 and 5, it says, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offering and sacrifice for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, and the volume of this book is written, To do thy will, O God. See, this city of habitation, is, it, it's true, it's the church, but what is the church? The church is, is actually styled in Colossians 1, 18 and 24 as the body. We're all bodies. We're habitations of God through the Holy Spirit. And when we come together, we form collectively the church of God. The church of God is made up of individual habitations of God. And that's where he brings the strayer. He brings them to a real revelation and a realization that God wants to dwell inside our vessel. First Corinthians, the third chapter, we are the temple of God. But he doesn't want us out there straying by ourselves. He wants us under the preached word of God, fellowshipping with the saints in the household of God. So he brings us to that habitation, which is the church of God. Amen. Amen. This city of habitation is Zion. It's a heavenly city. We read about it in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Hebrews 11 and verse number 10. Hebrews 11 and 10, it says, For he looketh for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What is that city? Verse 16, But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. What is this heavenly city? Well, go over to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Let's just get the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus said this. Now, Jesus came from God out of heaven. He dwelt in a body. That's Emmanuel, God with us, in a corporate body like every one of us are in today, this tonight. And the Bible says of Jesus speaking, he said, I will build, verse 18, he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Whose church is it? It's God's church. We read in Hebrews, the third chapter, Hebrews, the third chapter, Paul, the apostle Paul writing, said Hebrews 3 and 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. This heavenly Jerusalem or the church of God is named after the Father, God. It's the church of God. In Acts, the 20th chapter, and because listen, this is where the strayer is brought to. And the Acts, the 20th chapter, Paul names it. It's named about 12 times in the New Testament writings, 12 being a number of perfection. Uh, Acts 20 and 28, take heed, speaking to the elders at Ephesus, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed what? The church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. That's the only church he purchased. The church of God. Amen. You won't find any other in the word of God. In Psalms the 68th division, Psalms the 68th chapter, 
Psalm 68 says that God sets the solitary soul and the strayer in a family. The family of God. Paul said, I bow my knees unto the Father, whom the whole uh, family in heaven and earth is named. And in Psalm 68, in verse number 5, it says, A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. What is his holy habitation? We just defined it. It's the church of God. So he sets those who are lonely. Maybe you don't have an earthly father. Maybe your father rejects you. Maybe your mother rejects you. God will give you fathers. He'll give you mothers right here in his holy habitation. He'll give you people that care for your soul. And no one cares for your soul next to Christ and, of course, God and the Spirit, the Trinity. No one cares for your soul like the people of God care for your soul. And Psalm 68, and verse 5, says, The Father of the fathers and the judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. God setteth the solitary in families. What family? Paul defined it as the family of God. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. I say tonight that to the strayer that's been brought to this holy habitation, they have something to testify about. Number two, secondly, in, our, in this chapter, Psalms 107, and we're going to go down through this. We'll try to move along here. But in Psalms 107, secondly, we find the slave. Was anyone here tonight a prisoner in chains to sin? Don't raise your hand. Was anyone bound by sin? Was anyone a slave to self, sin, Satan? All of us. We all were. If you're saved, you were at one time a slave to all of those things. Well, the psalmist deals with this as a reason for us to testify. It says in Psalms 107 and verse 10, let's go on. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of the God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. That's a very, very dangerous thing to do. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down. There was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands and their chains in sunder. Verse 4, 15, oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to children of men. Verse 16, for he that hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. The children of Israel were in prison. They were, a sla they were in slavery because they re had rebelled against God's will. So they deserved to suffer. But when they cried out to God, he heard them and he set them free. How many times, how many times did God spare us death while we were in sin and slavery? Probably just about all of us here tonight would have been goners, or could have been goners, but for the mercy and grace of God. In Romans 6 and verse 20, Romans 6 and 20, for when we were the servants of sin, here's that slavery that people are so bound by tonight, Paul speaking to past tense, because we're not any longer when we're saved, when we don't continue on in sin, as verse 1 denotes. He says, for when we, ye were the servants of sin, ye were you were free from righteousness, or you, you, you didn't know righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Each of us was a slave to sin. Nice to see you both sit down so close tonight. As far as I'm concerned, you can sit there every night. I like to have that support down close. That's good. I just noticed that. It's good to have you down here. He runs our sound back there and does a good job with that. But anyways, got off track. Each of us was a slave to sin, and God delivered us. From that bondage. I like how the psalmist in the 40th division uh, describes it. Just beautifully portrays it in Psalms 40 and 1. 
Look at what I believe David's writing here, King David, a man after God's own heart. He said, I waited patiently, Psalms 41, I waited patiently <coughs> for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Now listen to what God did. Talking about slavery, first of all, it dealt with strain. Now we're dealing with the slave or those in slavery. It says, he brought me up also out. Boy, this really does away with that business of saying and sin, doesn't it? Sinner more or less every day, because God delivers us. He delivers us up and also out. Amen. If this building were a, a sinful, or let's say a building full of sin, God's desire would be to pick you up and drag you out, or lift you, carry you out. God, I don't mean this building is, but I'm just getting as a pictorial representation. God wants you out of that sinful house, that sinful life. Uh, those who are in sin tonight, God wants you out, up and out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay. You know how it was and, and how it is in clay. You try to get out. It's like the more you move, the deeper you go. It's the way it is in sin. You see, you know, it's the can't help it. You just have to do this. You have to do that. And you get deeper and deeper and deeper. If you lack the grace of God, you need that strength in your life. Myry clay and set my feet upon a rock. First Corinthians 10 and 4 says Christ is that rock and established my goings. And he has put a new song in my heart. When once you sang the blues, you now sing the happy tunes. Right? You have a new song. Amen. You desire new music probably as well, huh? New song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. It's impossible to have a testimony without a test. And David writes here about one of the greatest tests each of us face. Did you catch it? I waited patiently. The test of waiting. David declared four benefits of waiting here in these three verses. It lifted him out of despair because he waited. It, got, it lifted him out of despair. It set his feet on a solid rock ground or the rock, Christ. It steadied him as he walked and it put a new song of praise in his mouth. Often blessings cannot be received unless we go through the trial of waiting. Don't get in a hurry. Amen. God wants to set you free tonight. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse number 36, Hebrews 10 and 36, it says, For ye have need of patience, that after, and that little preposition denotes some space of time. After ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. In other words, you've done God's will. You need patience now. Because you want to see answers and you want to see results and you want to see things done now. Doesn't work always that way. Most times probably doesn't work that way. So the Hebrew writer says, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Ye have need of patience. Ye have need of patience. Jesus said in your patience possess ye your souls. God saved all of us from there, those who are saved from the bondage of self and sin. And in addition... There may be some here tonight that he saved from sectism, from false religion. And that is certainly something to shout and testify about. If God's put you in his holy habitation, the great church of the living God, that's something to testify about. Thirdly, we found out about the strayer. What was the second one? Thank you. The one in slavery. Thirdly, the psalmist speaks about the sufferer. Psalms 107. Let's go back there. Psalms 107 and verse number 17. Amen. The one, in su the one who's suffering, the one that's distressed, that's been afflicted. In Psalms 107, verse number 17, we're going to pick up. It says here, fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. 
Over and over we read here, and we're going to bring out five examples here, five cases. Over and over we read about God reaching down. God reaching down in mercy. They cried unto the Lord, and here the Lord is to, to save them out of their trouble. We're serving a great God. As Brother Croker often said, a great and a wonderful God. I think he was the one that often said that. And we certainly are. It goes on, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works. To the children of men, verse 22, and let them sacrifice the sacrifice of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. We move from the prison to the hospital where people were dying because of their foolish way of life. They had made their own bed and should lie in it. But did God leave them there? He was merciful. And he healed them from their suffering. While suffering as a result of a sinful lifestyle, God still showed mercy and rescued them. How many tonight do we know who've spent an amount of time in sin with the habits of life, and yet God will save them and give them many more years of living? That's God's mercy. That's God's mercy. The sufferer. Amen. The afflicted. Maybe you were in sin and you were dealing with a situation, a physical situation. God saved you, but he didn't only save you, he healed your body. That's God's mercy. Amen. David said this, in my distress, see to the saints that suffer, and saints suffer as well. In my distress, or I like what one rendering says, it says when seemingly closed in. You ever feel like you're just surrounded and closed in? You can't get anywhere or you feel a heavy cloud over you? David said, in my distress, when seemingly closed in, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. Psalms 34, 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of all, out of them all. All, amen, the sufferer, the afflicted. Certainly we're dealing with the sinner tonight and how God's had mercy on the sinner, but certainly the saint as well. I thought about Brother Job. Job suffered, and we can read about his suffering, and after suffering all that Job went through in that first chapter that we read about, the Bible says that Job blessed the name of the Lord. It said in Job 121, and he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. Thither the Lord gave him, the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. We can find Paul and Silas in prison, chained up. But they're not, and they had just been whipped, beaten. But they weren't bemoaning their condition. They, at midnight, they begin to sing and praise God. And in their testimony... It moved the heart of God, but it moved the heart of the people as well. Amen. I say tonight our testimony is quite powerful. Which of us deserved God's mercy? Did any of us deserve God's mercy? This too is something to testify about. Let's go on. Number four. Number four. We find the sailor. Let's read about the sailor in Psalms. Going back to the Psalms. Psalms 107, commencing with verse number 23 now. It says, they that go down to the sea in ships, speaking about the sailor. They go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. These seek the works, see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths, for their souls melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wits end. How many in a life of sin were at their wit's end? And God had mercy on them. There may have been some here tonight that even contemplated committed suicide. Terrible thing, right? But that works on us. That works on people. Many battle that. Many battle thoughts of, of, of what's my use? What's my value to humanity? Do I have any value? Does anyone even care? Will they care if I'm gone? Will they miss me? Yes. For one, God will. Because he placed you here for such a time as this. 
But many are at their wits' end, these seer, uh, seamen, these sailors. And it goes on to say here, amen, in verse number 28, then they cry unto the Lord. See, every one of them here, they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. One songwriter beautifully expressed it in this manner. There is peace in the midst of my storm-tossed life. There's an anchor. There's a rock to cast my faith upon. Jesus rides in my vessel, so I'll fear no alarm. He gives me peace in the midst of my storm, or that storm. Amen. But this peace came from Jesus. The Bible says, Philippians 4 and 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We don't have to reach wit's end if we'll find the way to this peace. Has anyone here tonight experienced the peace of God? If you have, you have something to testify about. Finally, we find the sower. Verse number 32, let them exalt him, the congregate also the congregation. Verse 33, let's go on. He turneth rivers into wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground. A fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. He turneth the wilderness into a standing water, and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, that, that they may prepare a city for habitation. Uh, verse 37, and sow the fields and plant vineyards, which may yield fruits of increase. He blesseth them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. Only God can send the rain that turns the wilderness into a garden. And only God can make the cattle multiply. We eat and are full. But do we ever take time to thank the Lord for giving us food? We must operate wisely and understand the loving kindness of our Lord. It goes on to say in verse 39, again, they are diminished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction and maketh his fam him families like a flock. The righteous shall see it and rejoice, and all iniquity shall stop their mouth. Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Now in our text it says, verse number 2, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. To be redeemed means to be bought back. It means to be rescued. It is connected with the practice of a kinsman redeemer who would rescue a close relative from death debt. God has done exactly this. He's paid a debt we could not pay. He has taken the exiled people, paid their debt, and has now redeemed them and gathered them back into their land. One rendering says it this way, verse number two, the International Children's Bible. This is what the Lord, the people, sorry, this is what the people the Lord has saved should say. They are the ones he has saved from the enemy. Who are the redeemed or saved? Or, or what are the redeemed or saved supposed to say? Verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. It's been said, silent gratitude isn't very much use to anyone. I'm thankful. How often do you say it? How often do you express it? I'm going to read the quote again. Silent gratitude isn't very much use to anyone. Gratitude is actually not a feeling. It's a practice. Gratitude is not a feeling. It's a practice. If you're thankful, you'll express it. I can't hardly help something within me when someone does just the smallest of things for me it's like wells up within me to, thank you. I appreciate that. 
But it's like some people you can go to jump over the, the moon for them, and they can sit there and hardly say a word. Something's wrong. Something's not quite right in here. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. God rescued Israel. God redeemed them from the wilderness. God pulled his people out of exile and gathered them again. But these great acts of redemption were only pointing to the greatest act of redemption, namely the rescue which Jesus Christ has provided every one of us. He has rescued us from sin and death. And it is through him that we will be ultimately gathered together as one. Amen. He brings us in, in, in conjunction with the, to the Father through the supernatural salvation. If Jesus has rescued you, then just as the psalmist declares, we are to say so. We are to tell of God's goodness and mercy to us. Or as one rendering puts it, those who are redeemed are to tell their story. Our scripture text is not merely a call to give a preacher an amen, but it is a call to respond to the mighty acts of God. If God has redeemed you from something, and if you are a Christian, he certainly has, then you're called to declare his mighty works. We are called to not only tell our story, but called to share how our story is just one more piece of evidence that the Lord is faithful and true. We're not to be shy about the Lord's work in our lives. I know the devil works on us that way. If you, we have been rescued, if you've been rescued by Jesus, then you should declare God's goodness and faithfulness to others. Look at the Apostle John. Here he's been banished on the Isle Patmos, exiled. And he was put there, really. It was the Lord's providence. He was really put there so he'd have some time to sit down and write this incredible book called the Revelation. But listen to what John says in that introductory chapter, the introductory verses of that first chapter. Revelation 1 and 1, re the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his uh, angel unto the servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and, and th they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep these things which are written. Therefore, for the time is at hand. Come down to verse number 9. I, John. Now here John's giving his own personal testimony. He's testifying. I, John, who also am your brother, and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom of pati and patience. Here he was in the kingdom in the first century. That will really confuse the minds of men. When they preach in a kingdom out in the future, John was already in the kingdom. The kingdom came 2,000 years ago, roughly. Where have you been? John was in the kingdom. In the first century, when he penned this letter, in the proximity of 80, 96 to 98, I believe, here he was in the kingdom. And patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God, for the testament of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard, and heard behind me a great voice and of, and of, uh, as of a trumpet. Here John is giving his personal testimony. He's testifying. Has this testimony that he gave moved the minds and hearts of men yet today? Is it moving people today? Sure it is. The value of testifying. The testimony of Jesus is a lifestyle and words that openly acknowledge our personal experience of following Jesus Christ. A testimony must be public because its purpose is to tell others what has taken place. In the Christian experience, our regeneration should be a testament, evidence to other people that Jesus is alive and is changing lives. He's still in the business tonight of changing lives. And there are many witnesses right here in my, our midst that can testify to that fact. We testify by our words, and we testify by our actions. If our lives are a testimony for Jesus Christ, then our conduct, communication, and character should be a reflection of Christ as we follow his steps. Look at Acts 4 and 33. Here are the apostles. The apostles, uh, get, we find them giving their testimony in words. In Acts 4 and verse number 33, and with great power, gave the apostles witness 
of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Or if you'll allow me to read this in another rendering, it says, And with great ability and power, the apostles were continuously testifying. Isn't that good? It wasn't just a one-time thing. Once every ten years kind of a thing. They were continuously testifying. The apostles testifying to the resurrection were telling others what they'd seen with their eyes, heard with their own ears, and touched with their own hands. They gave a personal eyewitness account of Christ's resurrection. In the same way, Christians today are commanded to tell others of what they've witnessed firsthand. Have we witnessed anything? I think about the heritage we have in this congregation. Think about the life of our pastor and the life of the saints, the croakers. And some of these stalwart saints down through the annals of this congregation. What a testimony we have. I know some of you more seasoned saints have even more than I do. Amen. Sister Sarah was name dropping tonight. She lost me just a little bit. Did anyone know who she was talking about? No one did. See, she's Sister Millie, Brother Brian. See, she's a little more seasoned than I am. But my point being is they have a few more stories to share. Let's hear them. Amen. We thank God for how he's worked over the years in this congregation. Amen. Did you like that name dropping? <laughs> Sister Sarah's been around for a couple moons. She was, uh, came along not long after the inception of the congregation, I think. Right up there close to the Fishers, of course. <laughs> Amen. All right. T continuously testifying. Amen. Christians today are commanded to tell others of what they've witnessed firsthand. I know Brother Jim, I like to hear his stories about Dad and he going out and trying to reach ones in Malala. And they come to a house with a big guard dog. And then it's you go first. No, you go first. Or it's your turn. I like to hear those stories. I don't get tired of hearing those stories. Amen. We haven't had to face a face-to-face a -face experience with Jesus as the apostles did. But our conversion experience is no less genuine and no less proof of God's supernatural work in our lives. While people may be able to argue teachings and argue doctrines, they cannot argue what God has done for you personally. We should eagerly share with boldness and humility the change that has taken place in our hearts. Listen to what is said of the morning time brethren. Revelation 12, 11. Revelation 12, 11. Speaking of the morning time brethren, and they, the morning time brethren, overcame him, their first foe, paganism, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. How did they defeat paganism in the first century? It was the word of their testimony. We're defeating Paganism yet today, and these many other spirits and religious systems, with the word of our testimony. What is it? The preached word of God. This only builds one church. And I, I don't, I'm not here to hurt anybody. Please don't, please understand. I love all people everywhere. I'm not here to hurt anybody. But we must take God's word. Everything we do in, in religion, and the religious actions that we take, everything in the name of religion, we must take God's word. Notice the word of their testimony, meaning these triumphant ones spoke verbally without shame of fear. Amen. Some believe that Christians ought not verbalize their testimony, but should simply live it out in their daily lives. But it's not an either-or proposition. Living the gospel message is absolutely important. It gives more impetus, more weight to what you say. But it doesn't take away from the fact that we're commanded to share verbally our testimony. Amen. Living the gospel message is important, but it's no more important than our verbal testimony since God has chosen hearing the word as the means of producing faith. Look at Romans. Amen. It says in Romans, look at the, the benefit of hearing this. Romans 10 and 17, it says, So then faith cometh by hearing. 
What inspires our faith? Hearing about it. Hearing the preached word. Hearing Sister Cucumber stand up and say, the Lord just healed me of this affliction. Or just took away my headache. Or just worked this out in my life. That inspires our faith. Amen. This verbal testimony. How about the Samaritan woman that Jesus dealt with in John the 4th chapter? John 4 and verse 39. It says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. For what she had to say, they believed on him. The testimony. The testimony. The importance of this. A life dedicated to Christ is a powerful testimony. Paul describes it such, a, such a life in 2 Corinthians 1 and 12. He said, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. That in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly, abundantly to you words. Excuse me. When our actions of godly living match the words coming from our lips, our testimony will be seen as true. A Christian who wants to live his life as a testimony for Jesus will love God above all else and love others above himself. Did you catch that? Can I say that again? A Christian who wants to live his life as a testimony for Jesus will love God above all else and love others above himself. When a believer shares what Jesus has done in his life, and serves God and others in tangible ways, he will increasingly reflect the life-giving power of Christ into a dark and dismal world. There's a children's song that beautifully presents this truth. It says, Do you know, O Christian, your sermon and shoes? Do you know, O Christian, your sermon and shoes? Jesus is counting upon you to spread the gospel news. How do we do it? So walk it and talk it a sermon in shoes. We may be the only Bible some people read and the only Jesus some people see. Our testimony matters. Now can I bring you, and I'm going to soon close, but can I bring you some general rules for testifying? Just quickly. And don't get offended by this. But Galatians 5 and 13 instructs us to not use liberty as, a case, as an occasion to the flesh. Just because we have the freedom to stand up and testify any, anytime we want, doesn't mean that we should. And I say that out of deep respect and not to hurt, hurt or hinder anyone and not to throw a stumbling block in your way. These are just some general truths pertaining to testifying. We must make sure our testimony is indeed led by the Spirit and is not a fleshly impulse. Also, it's to build up Christ, not ourselves. It's not to talk about you know, us, you know, in our old life, we fought Marilyn Manson and we took down Joe Blow and Hulk Congan. We were on his rink back in our good old days. But Jesus saved us. What's that about? What's that about? That's an occasion to the flesh. That's build, building yourself. Well, back in my old days, I was quite the ladies, man. I had a lot of girlfriends and boyfriends. and But the Lord saved me and gave me a good wife. What's that about? What's that about? And I'm not saying anyone's doing any of that, but I'm merely bringing this as some general rules. Use not liberty as an occasion of the flesh. Amen. We should make sure the Spirit's leading us. We should learn to read body language. If we stand up to testify and we're going on and on and on and on, pretty soon, this, soon all the saints have their heads bowed and they're praying, it's probably time to sit down. We should learn to read some body language. The Bible teaches that everything in our public worship services should be done decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14 and 40. This means that someone must keep order and we must subject ourselves to the one who's keeping the order. That means if there's not time for the testimony right now, we should be okay with that. Because we're not in charge. My students want to get up and go to the bathroom sometimes in the middle of things and I'll say, just a minute. I'll say, wait till so-and-so gets back. I only want one person in the hallway at a time or whatever. Wait till they get back. And I, that's okay. I'm the one keeping order. And they should subject themselves and submit to that order. It's no, no different than the church of God. God desires for, <coughs> excuse me, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. 
that there be order in our services. He's not a God of chaos. He's not a God of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, I believe, tells us that. Everything in public worship should be done unto edify, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. That is to say, it should build the listeners up, not tear them down. <clears throat> when we stand up to testify, we shouldn't have an axe to grind and try to tear our brother down. It should be to build up the work of God, to tell what God has done. Testifying is telling your own story, not someone else's. Testifying is not done to correct the congregation. That's the role or office of a bishop or a pastor. It's not the job of the people. Testifying, I'm going to prove it to you right here by the Bible, it's telling your own story. Let me read it to you just a little further. Psalms 107 and 2, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Let me read this out of two other renderings. International, the New International Version says, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. I like that. Each of us has our own story to tell. The New Living says, has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Amen. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. It goes on to say, I didn't finish that, the other part of that verse with the New, New International. But it says, tell their story. And the, the other version says, speak out. A testimony is unique to the person. And there are no two people that are exactly alike. No one can give your testimony for you. Your testimony should be shared with others. If you don't share it, who's going to share it? Right? If God has redeemed you, then should you speak up and speak out. God has done so much for every one of us tonight. And we have so much to thank him for. He wants us to tell everyone, certainly as he directs us, all that he's done for us. When we live in God's presence, we will not be able to keep his glorious experience to ourselves. God has done so much for all of us, and we should seek for opportunities to tell others. I think of a story Brother Wilson told, uh, and I, I heard this, and I thought about this as I was studying. I may not have all the details correct or exactly how they were, but essentially Brother Wilson talked about how he looked for those opportunities to in, insert God into about every conversation. And he talked about taking his old uh, motor home or camper, maybe mom was in that motor home, but anyways, to the repairman, I think he was in a mechanic shop or something, and he was looking for that opportunity to insert some things about God in that conversation. And, and so the mechanic was talking to him, and well, Reverend Wilson, he was kind of addressing him, you know how the world does with a minister, and you know, he was talking to him about his work or whatever, and he said, uh, Brother Wilson, or basically he said, Brother Wilson, and I'm going to just bring it as I re recall, he said, do you, do you ever like to go fishing? And Brother Wilson thought, there's the opportunity. He said, what kind of bait do you like to use? And he got up in that motorhome and grabbed his Bible. He said, I'm a minister, a pastor, or whatever. He said, and I use the word of God to fish for men. And God opened up that opportunity to testify. See, if we want to testify, God will provide those awesome opportunities. If you've experienced great trials, you have the potential for great praise. Now, if you need additional reasons to testify, I want to give you a few more hurriedly. In our song, in the hymnal of the Church of God, we have this song, Tell What the Lord Has Done For You. And it says this, have you found rest and peace within, rolled far away your load of sin, stepped into the old, uh, stepped from the old life to the new? Tell what the Lord has done for you. Have you a friend whose wondrous grace lights up with joy this darkest place, who to the end will, prove, will still prove true? Tell what the Lord has done for you. Have you been saved, his love to show? Who by your side each day doth go, looking to him to help you through? Tell what the Lord has done for you. Have you a joy that ne'er shall fail, e'en when you walk through death's dark veil? Someone whose power great things can do. Tell what the Lord has done for you. Oh, tell what he's done for you. Of his love so strong and true. Oh, tell what he's done for you, what he's done for you. Others may need him too. And there's the benefit of you giving your personal testifying. To the demon-possessed man whom Christ had delivered, he said, how be it? Jesus suffered him not. He desired to go with Christ. Christ said, no, basically. He said, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee. Jesus said, if we don't share our testimony, 
the rocks will cry out. See, the disciples said, oh, Lord, hush the people. They're too loud. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Let them be. In essence, let them be. They're celebrating me. Let them be. If, they, if, they, if the disciples hold their praise, it was the disciples he was speaking about there. If they hold their praise, the rocks will cry out. In Psalms 107, and I'm just about through, verse 32, it says here, Psalms 107 and 32, Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Did you know that this is the friendliest, friendliest environment in which to testify? If we don't testify here, are we really testifying out there? Just something to think about. Don't want anyone to get offended, but let's think about this. The Bible instructs us to testify in the congregation there. Let me read it again. Uh, exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders right here. Amen. It's the friendliest environment in which to testify. Every one of us has something beneficial to offer to the services. And again, I say it doesn't mean every, ser every service, as I spoke about the principles there, are truths to testify. But as God directs you, as he lays it upon your heart, and certainly out there, as you have opportunity, someone may say, I'm too shy. Well, if you read Isaiah, the 11th chapter, you'll read and find that God, Christ came, God sent his son to change our nature. And we can read in he, uh, Acts, the fourth chapter, Acts, the fourth chapter. See, if you're a really meek person, and that's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that at all, and you're very mild, nothing wrong with that at all, and you're just kind of cool in your temper, that's wonderful. Maybe you're kind of shy, that's okay. But listen, God wants you to testify as well. And the Bible says in Acts, the fourth chapter, verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, what gave Peter and John boldness to testify? Let's read the summation of that verse. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, verse 2, they were unlearned ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them. What gave them that boldness? They had been with Jesus. See, when you spend time with Jesus, it's going to make you excited, like a salesman. And you're going to sell the product. When you know salvation and you know what God can do, it's like, wow, let me tell some others what God can do. Amen. There's many of you that came to the Lord with next to nothing in your bank account. Maybe you borrowed. I know how that was early on in our married life. It got difficult. And there were some of you saints that stepped in. The boys stepped in. Sister Shelley, Sister Tarina stepped in. The Britos, I think, others stepped in and would hand us a little money here and a little money there. We appreciate that. When you think about where God brought you, that's God's goodness. That's something to testify about. Amen. I think the Britos came here with next to nothing. And now Brother Jack's a business owner in the community. Amen. That's God's goodness and his mercy. I think about the knowledge Brother Brian has in the ways of science and nature. But if he had gone the ways of the world, he may not even have a mind to use. But he's got a sharp mind to use. And other brethren, Brother Chad in the car industry, Brother Chris in the insurance, and you go right down the line. But if these brothers had gone the way, think about how many of the people your age or younger have fried their brains with drugs. Horrible, horrible, sad. That's God's mercy. And that's something to testify about. We found in our study tonight that God saved the strayer, the slave, the sufferer, the sailor, the sower. In reality, all of us were the strayer. We were the slave. We were the sufferer. We were the sailor. We were the sower. We strayed aimlessly in sin until we saw the light. We wandered far from God. We were slave to sin. We suffered from our sinful choices and decisions we made. We were tossed about on life's raging sea with no hope in sight. And we sowed our wild oats. We should testify about how God brought us from a life of self-sin and for some, some of us from sectism or false religious systems of some kind, and placed us into the kingdom of his dear son, the church of God. 
No matter how extreme our calamity, God is able to help us. He's loving, kind, and to those who are distressed, he wants to rescue you. I say tonight, dear heart, that this is something to testify about. This is something to testify about. And I'm through. Amen. And if anyone has a testimony, I don't mean to drag the service on with testimonies tonight, but certainly in the services to come, take your liberty. But does anyone have anything to share before we sing a song in closing? Brother Holtry, we'll give you 30 seconds. I'm just teasing you. Go right ahead. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Beautiful. God healed his body. Anyone else? Appreciate everyone being. Brother Brian, go right ahead. a Buddhist and I thought oh Lord thank you because I thought and uh, but I don't want to I never want to offend people I don't want to hurt people but I want the truth and we want to be a vessel of mercy as that song we want to be a vessel of mercy but I he said a Buddhist and I said well I said um, I said can I talk to you a little bit about this he said sure so then I told him, I said, uh, have you heard about Jesus? That Jesus said in John 14 and 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I said, but did you know that Buddha said he was looking for a way? But Jesus said, I am the way. I said, isn't that something? I said, think about that. Buddha said, I'm looking for a way. But Jesus said, I am the way. There's a big difference. And I said, did you know that Buddha, he starved himself to death because he was looking for something, but he couldn't find it. But Jesus said, I am the way. And I said, dear one, have you ever looked at his life? How that his life was impeccable. There is no greater example of any living human being that I know of. Because they'll talk about Muhammad. They'll talk about Confucius. They'll talk about Zoroastrianism. They'll talk about all these other isms. But I'm thankful there is no greater example then Christ, and then I had an opportunity to tell him what Jesus has done for me. And I told him that I got saved. I had no use for religion because I didn't see it lived. But when I came to the church and God saved me, and I said that the red was redder and green was greener, and that he changed my life. And I said, young man, consider these. Think about these things, that Jesus is the way. He is who he said he is. Amen. Thank the Lord. Anyone else? Be beautiful. Beautiful. Shall we stand? Let's take our offering. Appreciate everyone being here tonight. Let's take our offering in closing. Sister Laney, what page? 276 in the Church of God hymnal. Yes? All right, let's sing together, and we'll take our evening offering. 276. Amen.
shall sing and shall talk with the bright angelic host where all sorrow and sighs flee away i'm redeemed praise the lord i'm redeemed by the blood of the lamb i am saved from all sin and i'm walking in the everyone being here this evening. Are there any announcements as we dismiss? All right. Remember, Sunday school, 930 Sunday, and main service, and then the special service Sunday night. Yes. Thank you. Yes, the Montana trip. Uh, just to let, give you an update, uh, our pastor was just doing so much, even in his dying days, to plan event things and plan meetings. And uh, due to 